Whoa! Get that pose here. <laughs> did, I, did I get that? Did I get yeah. that? Now I'm going to check the constellations in the sky. Okay. <laughs> NASA was founded the same week that I was born. Okay. So I feel NASA's pain. I, we are the same age. We. <laughs> uh, so if you read there, it makes it very clear that Earth is in the portfolio. And so too is, for example, aeronautics, which is one, what one of the A's stands for in NASA. So to turn around and say NASA is only about deep space is, you might want it to be that way, but that's not what's in the charter. If you want to change the charter, okay, but you can't come to NASA and say you should not spend money on aerospace or on Earth, when in fact that's in the charter. Now, that being said, if you unpack the budget, the most recent budget is around $18.5 billion, you will see money allocated for Earth sciences and much more money allocated for space exploration and space support. So that is space, uh, like the sustaining the space station, launch capabilities, this sort of thing. So it'd be something different if most of the money was being spent on Earth and less being spent on stage, but that, that's not the case. So you could debate what the ratio should be. I, I, don't, I don't have a problem with that. But if you're going to ignore Earth and no one else is paying attention to Earth the way NASA is, um, you, could be, you could be planting the seeds of your own extinction. So it seems to me it, it's a good thing to know what, what's going on on Earth when seen from space. Earth as a planet is how we need to think of it. And when you study other planets, by the way, Earth does not have the largest volcano in the solar system. Earth does not have the largest, I mean, there are a lot of things that other planets have more of than Earth. And so comparative planetology becomes fundamental to understanding where Earth came from, where it is, and where it might be headed. So, uh, yeah, and I, and I saw the hearing. And so uh, Ted Cruz has, was trying to get him to say, yeah, yes, NASA is about deep space and not about Earth. But uh, um, what NASA does in deep space is far more visible than anything else it does. That's for sure. But that doesn't mean that's um, all NASA does in its portfolio. That's all. I don't know if our country has any precedent for emergent scientific mm -hmm. truths to be uh, to be debated on political grounds. I'm astonished by that, actually. Disappoint astonished and disappointed. I thought as a nation we were above this. If you go back to the first Republican president, who was who? Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln. Um, a little known fact about his administration, because we were also distracted by war and freedom and slavery under his rule, mm -hmm. rule under his presidency. Uh, un, in 1963, the same year of the Gettysburg Battle and the Gettysburg Address, perhaps the bloodiest year on American soil ever, he signed into law the creation of the National Academy of Sciences. This is a body that still exists today, and it was conceived to advise the executive branch and Congress on scientific matters so that they can make informed policy decisions. They weren't established so that politicians could debate whether what they say is true. So my concern is that if you have political swaths of people who are in denial of emergent scientific truths, then they're not at the table to influence policy that could serve their political interests later on, right? Uh, the fact that we have politics at all means people don't always agree. And that's, I think that's a healthy fact about any free society. Uh, same with religion, the free expression of religion. 
uh, that's, that's healthy. That's why America exists in its pluralistic ways. But when you say, let's debate whether or not humans are influencing climate, you are losing time that you could be debating what to do in the face of that fact. And presumably, Democrats have different ideas about what to do in the face of that fact than Republicans do. Do you have carbon credits? How, do you subsidize green energy? Whatever is your policy that would derive from it, that's, in my opinion, the kinds of conversations that should be going on in Congress right now. Oh, and by the way, um, people like to blame politicians for everything. And I've stopped doing that. After I thought this through, about 15 years ago, I stopped. I, I, I no longer blame politicians for a damn thing. Because we vote for the politicians. So who's ultimately accountable here? It's the electorate. It's the electorate. I've been asked. We have a member of Congress who's, who chairs the, uh, the, he's on the science committee. And he is sure the universe is 6,000 years old. And everyone wants to go beat him on the head. I'm saying, he's duly elected by people. This is what representational government is, all right? If, if that's what his electorate thinks, then it's his duty to reflect that view. So if, if we have issues now with that, because if you say the universe is 6,000 years old, that is not derived from any scientific understanding of the universe. Um, then the challenge is educating the electorate, not beating politicians over the head. That's, that's my sort of emergent sense of the world in my old age. Sorry, my answers are very long. I, I can shorten them. I, we're going to sound bite mode. I can do sound bite, yeah. No, okay, next question. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm I, I, not that I don't want that to happen, of course, I'd, I'd be delighted. I'm just skeptical that anything on the books right now, anything planned, ha has any real chance of succeeding uh, as a colony. Colony implies you, you pitch tent and the people sort of living there and hanging out and doing experiments, maybe have some tourism, why not? Uh, there's money there, as Florida residents know. And so uh, <laughs> tourism can drive entire economies. So um, I, I see a colony on the moon before I see a colony on Mars. It takes three days to get to the moon and nine months to get to Mars. And you got to wait for the orbits to line up again to come back. So any journey to Mars is a three year, at least, round trip. Whereas you can go to the moon and come back within a new cycle. Right, you can track that. Hey, how you doing? Oh, we're just crossing the midpoint. We're good. Look at Earth. Look at the Moon. You go to Mars. You have like months and months where ain't nothing happening. So, uh, oh, funny thing about Mars is if you're going to send crews, you got to make sure they're really compatible. Because there's no. Let me take a you know walk around the block. No, you're stuck in the in the in the vessel. Uh, so, oh, by the way, the what makes it un, unlikely, I think, for me, is not the technology of it. There's still some things to solve, but any engineer thrives on engineering challenges. So I, I have no doubt that we couldn't solve it, any engineering challenge. It's just a matter of policy and money, always. And we went to the moon driven by military motives. We remember the phrase in Kennedy's speech, we'll put a man on the moon return safely to Earth before the decade is out. We do these things not because they're easy, but because they're hard. Well, you, you know, you, you flip the page. Oh, we have to, you know, beat the Russians, kill the commies, all right? That's the other side of the page that is being read, let's go to the moon. And so you have the military driver. Sorry to use your thing there. <laughs> and so when you have military drivers, money flows like rivers. Now, I'd like to think that if you have economic drivers, money can also flow like, like rivers. So you, if you find an economic reason to go to Mars. It'll happen overnight. It's just very hard to do that first and have that and, and have an ROI on a first voyage to Mars. Yeah. Does Sir Cinema Magazine have a question? Oh, oh by the way, uh, I, I have this diabolical plan yes. where uh, 
I want to go to China and go visit the leader of China and go, Psst, leak a memo that you want to put military bases on Mars. <laughs> Don't have to be real, just leak that, okay? Shows up in the Pentagon, we are on Mars 10 months later. <laughs> One month to fund, design, build a spacecraft, nine months to get there. Uh, so I, I joke about that. China, if they say they want to go to Mars, they're going to Mars. Uh, they've been very good about their promises. And I, I joke about this also. Mars is already red. So be it marketing, you can market that easy in China. You totally got that. Um, next. Yeah. Um, so what is and you are from where? Sarasota Magazine. Sarasota Magazine. Sarasota Magazine. Um, what is the one scientific discovery you'd like to see made in your lifetime? I want to find life that on places other than Earth, a any place other than Earth. So, uh, and I think that is a, or rather, I want to know for sure whether or not there's life elsewhere in our solar system. So that doesn't pre-require the result. It just al allows the exploration to determine that. And you follow the water, which is a NASA mantra because everywhere on Earth there's water, there's life. Even the Dead Sea has life. The fact that it was called the Dead Sea meant the people who named it had no access to a microscope. Okay, it just has no fishes in the Dead Sea. So uh, there's, there's water on, we think, subterranean on Mars. There's a moon of Jupiter with water. Uh, that, in fact, a moon that has liquid on it that's not even liquid water, has liquid methane, Maybe life doesn't need liquid water, maybe it just needs a liquid. So these are questions that I would love answered in my lifetime and I think they can be realistically addressed. We have two students from Pineview here today. Would one of you like to ask Dr. Tyson? Are you guys right here? Yeah. yeah. Okay, looking sharp today. <laughs> very nice. Thank you very much. Okay. I think people overreact to what that might be. Um, we've managed to adjust to the realization that we're not special, all right? We realize Earth is not the center of the known universe. It took some adjustment, but we got over it and moved on to learn that we have DNA in common with all other life on Earth. The people were upset by that, realizing how close we are genetically to chimpanzees, for example. Um, people, most people got over that. Uh, emphasis on most. Is, Clearly not all, um, but so if you find out that there's life elsewhere, I, I think it'd just be fun for people to, and plus we've been, we've had heavy doses of that from the science fiction genre. So it's not like it's a thought nobody has ever come up with. Now, what could be transformative is if we find life that is vastly more intelligent than we are. Uh, that, I think that would freak out <laughs> most people. There's some people who are sure that there is no God, we were created by a more intelligent species of aliens, and that becomes the entity that you would worship. Um, and so there's whole communities of people who, so you have a creation story, but the creation story is with aliens and not with deity. Um, so uh, people, people that, that would be, a, that'd be an interesting one. I, I fantasize, not fantasize that I'd want this to be true, I fantasize that it could be true that, in fact, Earth is just a zoo set up by a vastly more intelligent species and we exist for their entertainment. <laughs> That's not much different from what we do with zoos. We put penguins in a, we draw some icebergs on the wall, throw some ice cubes in it, <laughs> and penguins are just waddling around. Maybe they have no idea that they're not in the South Pole, right? I, I don't know. I'd like to hope that penguins are smarter than that, but if not, they, we, create, we are smarter than they are, we created a habitat, and they walk around like they're at home. So maybe that's what's happening with us. <laughs> if that's the case, that's, that's kind of like living in the matrix, in a, in a sense. So it's kind of fun to think about that. But uh, as a scientist, I would try to get a hold of the alien scientist and see what they've discovered about the universe that we've been struggling with. If they're smarter than we are, some of our most intractable problems might be easy to them. And so really, you need some scientists in your diplomatic party, because they're not gonna speak French, they're not gonna know how to shake your hand, 
you might extend your hand to shake some appendage of theirs, and it might be the wrong appendage that you're shaking. <laughs> so you need some like biologists, some you know, you need some people who speak a language that we know scatters across the universe, and that's math and science. By the way, as a point I'll make in my talk in a few minutes is Cosmos, the series, the fact that that aired on Fox, a major network in primetime is an extraordinary fact. I, I, don't, I don't know any other uh, step, uh, any other me media presence that science could have had that would have had the reach that that did. So each of these are just sort of baby steps and all the rest of these are baby steps in an attempt to sort of give access to everyone who wants it and needs it on a level that you might even just stumble on it. You had a question too. Okay. Um, Last question. Yeah. Well, my, You've got it. Uh, my science teacher. That puts a whole lot of pressure on you. <laughs> <laughs> you look and see the cameras are rolling here. Yeah. <laughs> well, my science teacher gave me an idea to look up to look some stuff up on Scientific American, uh -huh. and I found an article that was describing Polchinski's theory of firewalls and black holes, and how um, it would discredit a little bit of uh, Einstein's general theory of relativity. I was wondering if you've heard of that. Uh, so. The general theory of relativity, actually, we are in the centennial this year of Einstein's general theory of relativity. Just give it up for Einstein on that one. <laughs> give, give a little love to Einstein. Uh, Einstein is so, so smart that you never have to tell someone, oh, by the way, he won a Nobel Prize, because he's bigger than the Nobel Prize itself, which is, I think, very cool. Um, the, the idea that a black hole uh, this firewall concept is, relates to, if it's the idea that I'm thinking of, it relates to the fact that if you fall into a black hole, um, you, it, the different, you get if, if it's the one I think it is, I, I, do you have the title of the paper, or is it? Um, not the title, but I know that it's regards like the horizon of yeah, the yeah, yeah. how you get va vaporized instead of sucked in. Yeah, no, it has to do, well, there's a, it has to do with what happens to information as it goes into a black hole. And the firewall would be, does that information ever come back out at all? And if it, if it goes in and never comes out, then in a way it has left our universe and gone into some other universe. That means our universe is losing information. And is that even possible? Can that happen? Should that happen? And information theory, which is a relatively modern branch of, of, of science and philosophy, um, has addressed these, these questions and these issues. Um, general theory of relativity is very specific tenets, and we know where its limits are. It's an incomplete theory of the universe. So to say it disproves general th relativity, we're waiting for a more comprehensive understanding of the universe to come forth, and this is what the string theorists are doing. Uh, so uh, the phrase, general theory might be wrong, that's journal, that's, Journalists like <laughs> saying stuff like that, okay? Rather than, oh, here is an aspect of it that could mod be modified to enclose a, a, a broader understanding of the universe. Yeah, so no need to lose sleep over this one. <laughs>